Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home studio office, and I'm here with my colleague and friend uh, and co-conspirator, the intrepid Scott Bernstein. Hey now, partner in crime. Partner in crime. And um, also would like to remind everyone, please subscribe to our podcast on YouTube or the audio version if you listen to it on Spotify, Google, Apple, other places. Also, check out Scott's online magazine, Gangster Report, and um, please support us on social media. We appreciate that. We we see the comments on YouTube and uh, Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, and you know, it's just the three of us, so sometimes it takes a while for us to to get back, but um, we appreciate the support and also spread the word. It's very helpful when you, you know, uh, share share the content. So anyhow, we have an interesting episode tonight. Uh, we're going to go with one of the most well-known, talk about one of the most well-known and infamous mafiosi of all time, and uh, Nikki Scarfo who was the boss of Philadelphia. And we're basically going to deep dive his, his life. We've referenced him in a number of other episodes. We've had a number of Philadelphia episodes where he comes up, but this is the first time we'll devote the whole episode to his, his, his uh, really rise and fall. And, um, and I'll be able to contextualize some of my kind of firsthand experience writing mafia Prince, which is, you know, the pinnacle of my career and, you know, my opus, you know, my, it's my, it's my Moby Dick. It's my, uh, war and peace. Um, very proud of it. And, uh, you know, help put me on the map and open the door to me being able to report about Philadelphia, which is really my favorite, favorite subject, um, to report on when it comes to organized crime. And, uh, well, that, that's I, one I've of the reasons, really, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but that's one of the reasons why when I pitched this to Scott and said, maybe we should do this is, People, speaking of people contacting us on social media, people have asked, you know, why, why doesn't Scott talk more about Mafia Prince? People are a fan of that book. So we're going to our point of departure here is Nikki Scarfo. That'll be the main issue here. But we're going to tie this into Scott's experiences writing a book with Nikki's nephew, who was also a high ranking member himself. Underboss. Yeah. So you want to start us off, Bernie? Like uh, maybe. Well- Bit of He's what's just, going on now and how how this oh yeah. uh how this uh we can connect that to this historical case study well you know the philadelphia uh, mob has been in the news quite a bit late summer early fall 2023 with the news that alleged current mob boss uh, skinny joy merlino is jumping into the podcasting game and uh jumping out in front of the camera You know, according to him and his people, he's been retired from running the mafia in Philadelphia since he got out of prison about 12 years ago, moved to Florida. He's now entering the, you know, the the social media influencer space. So you can you can make a direct um, line from Joy Merlina, whether or not he's the boss or not. Uh, I, I personally believe he is. That's what I've reported. Um, but he's not he, he's not a day to day caretaker of the family like he once was. He's a, a boss you know, from a distance and doesn't really have any day to day say of what's going on there. Uh, just to clarify that. But, uh, you know, he, he grew up around Nicky Scarfo. His dad, Salvatore Chucky Merlino, was Nicky's best friend. Um, spent his whole life or his whole early life at, at Nicky and his dad's side learning what it meant to be uh, a powerful leader of organized crime and someone that ruled over lots of territory and and had a lot of people that were, you know, subordinates and and how to structure that and how to lead, how to deal with problems that kind of, I'm sure, run the gamut. He was exposed to a lot of that stuff at a very young age. Um, but, you know, Nikki Scarfo, just to kind of go back to our our, our focus here, you know, grew up, well, was born in, in, in Brooklyn, moved to uh, South Philly when he was about 11 or 12 years old, and uh, was an amateur boxer, 
I think he worked in the blueberry fields for a while in Hamilton, New Jersey. New Jersey's then, known for blueberries, by the way. I don't yeah. know if people knew that. <laughs> They're like a famous and, nationwide famous place for their blueberries. And then was was ushered into the Philadelphia Mafia by his uncles, the Piccolo brothers, who all went by the nickname Buck. Tony Buck, Nicky Buck, Mikey Buck. Um, and he got he got his button in the 1950s. And by the 60s, he is living in Atlantic City. Uh, there's a lot of speculation on how he ended up there, a lot of conjecture that he was exiled after a, a fight that he had uh, where he killed him, killed a fellow diner uh, at a uh, the Oregon, uh, Oregon diner in South Philly, fighting over a seat at a lunch counter, I believe. He, he stabbed him with a fork. He stabbed him with a fork. Yeah, yeah. And it killed, uh, it, killed, it killed the guy. Yeah. And um, from my research and from, from talking to people that were close to Nikki, including Phil, that, that he wasn't the, the, the narrative that he was kicked out of Philadelphia and sent to Atlantic City uh, as penance uh, by Angelo Bruno, who at that point was the godfather. That's That's just not true. Um, well, it wouldn't be. Um, it, well, I mean, maybe it's not true, and that's a pretty good source, I would say. But it it's not doesn't sound insane, right? I mean, because no, Bruno, that's no, not, that sense. wasn't Bruno's yeah. style, right? I mean, you could you could imagine that that's something that would aggravate Angelo Bruno. But and also, I think that one of his soldiers <laughs> just killed a guy over a in yeah. public over a seat. But I I think one of my one of my takeaways from my research uh, writing Mafia Prince and, and sitting and interviewing uh, Phil was that the image and reputation that Angelo Bruno had as the, the docile Don or this peaceful, you know, uh, arbiter of, of, uh, of, of gangland conflict was a little bit of a, a misnomer as well. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that too. That he was actually a, not to say he wasn't um, overly violent sure. the way that his, you know, the way that his successors were, right. Ricky Scarfo, uh, central among them, but he definitely wasn't anti-violence and was somebody that was, if circumstances arose, was quick to order a murder. Yeah, and that's he that's had, my he had bought, I mean, He had quite a few bodies. So, yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, I guess I would say that. It, it. I don't think he would have lost sleep over that Scarfo killed a guy, but rather that it was so public. Yeah, may have may have irritated. But him. I, I think it was more like there is fertile racket territory to be yeah. mined in Atlantic City. Um, go mine it. Yeah, it what, and, and that's what he did. I mean. Uh, he, he had pretty much control of that whole uh, region of of, uh, of racketeering when gambling legalization uh, started to uh, happen in, in New Jersey and and all of the uh, casinos started to be built. Yeah, you know, he he was he had a foothold in there for the previous twelve fifteen years. Well, yeah, I want I want to. Add something about that, but I want to ask you a question about genealogy here, if you if you know. So, his uncles were always in Philadelphia. Did he? I mean, how how does he? Does do they go from Brooklyn to Philadelphia because they already have pre existing family in Philadelphia? And so, because his father wasn't a mafia guy, right? Uh, it was on his mother's side that he was connected to that world, wasn't it? To, to, to the Piccolos, yeah, right. I don't I think, mean, his, I think dad his, was a, his dad was a wasn't necessarily a straight arrow. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't. I, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, but he wasn't. But he, he wasn't he a was heavier. More, no, he wasn't a main guy. He he was definitely more influenced by uh, Nicky Buck and Tony Buck. Okay. Who would become part of it was because of how uh, you know how fate took their nephew and. 
uh, ascended him to the to the throne. But you know, the, both Piccolo brothers were, or in terms of Tony Buck and Nicky Buck, were were very relevant uh, in in Philadelphia mob affairs all the way through the late 1980s. And with with Tony Buck, you know, he was uh, at one point he was acting boss, and then he became you know consigliere um, to John Stanford. Um, in the nineties. So I'll just say that these were guys that weren't just, you know, ordinary run of the mill, right. Buttons. These were guys that Nikki, the uh, Nikki Piccolo became little Nikki's consigliere. And then Tony Piccolo, Tony Buck became his acting boss. And then eventually, uh, Nikki Scarfo's successor, John, or immediate successor, John Stampa's consigliere. What about the, you tell me if this is part of the urban legend, but there's also this story that a maid guy wanted Nikki Scarfo to date his daughter, and Nikki Scarfo said so it's kind of like a rude uh, dismissal of that idea. And that this he wanted, to wanted to marry his daughter. It was Joe okay. Meta. Okay, yeah. Tell tell that, and, if, and if you think that that's a true that that really went down, yeah, uh, that uh, that did happen. Okay. Angelo Bruno's consigliere. Uh, Joe Regnetta, they call him Joe the Boss. And uh, yeah, Joe Regnetta wanted to marry one of his daughters off to Nikki Scarfo, and Nikki wasn't having it. He called uh, Regnetta's daughters ugly, and that was very offensive to Joe Regnetta. And um, I, honestly, I think that proved that that was a bigger reason for him getting out of Philly than, than what happened with the uh, at the Oregon Diner. And his uncles had to intercede, right? And yeah, to kind of calm things down. Yeah, and and Angelo Bruno might not have loved Nikki, but he valued Nikki, and he knew he was a um, a valuable asset. So, is my time is my time frame right here the chronology um, that when he goes to Atlantic City? That's actually before legalized gambling. Yeah, that's well, one but, reason why it, it's considered exile is there actually wasn't a lot of action at that point, other than maybe shaking down local drug dealers, right. some you know, extor- extorting bars and restaurants. Well, construct and construction companies, was what, which was, was what, Scarf Inc., which was he had concrete right. pouring, which right. he again he had a foothold in these in these uh, businesses and these trades, including you know union infiltration. Uh, but before casino legalization was even, you know, on the table, even in discussion. Right. So once once it is announced that it, that that legalized gambling is going to happen or it's in likelihood going to pass. Scarfo, ironically, if you if it, if it was an exile, he's in the right place at the right time. Right. Because he's he actually gets in on the construction of those. Oh, all the casinos. <laughs> right. Like, good luck competing with Scarf Inc. Yeah. Right, like, like literally, like they they might kill you, and that and and that's and they control all the so they control the construction, the pouring of the concrete for all you know for the renovation of Las Vegas and this uh, remodeling, rebranding. AC, not not Vegas. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Atlantic <laughs> City. Yeah, I knew what you meant. Wait, um, and they poured all the concrete, and then they control all of the the trades with the unions, and then they control all of the workers. With the the the, the bartenders and, and casino workers union, so he he's in on the ground floor in terms of laying the cement for for the casinos, but but he's also infiltrated the unions. So right, right place and, at the right time. It's very lucrative for Scarfo legally. Right, and then gambling. and then Bruno also has Ralph Natale, who will play a role uh, later on as well uh, as his union troubleshooter and and uh, hitman. And uh, that also helped uh, quite a bit. You know, there's a lot to to knock Ralph about um, later on in his mob career as as a quasi boss. But uh, it's definitely true that Ralph was on the front lines of getting everything in line in terms of the unions uh, for what eventually became Atlantic City. And and he murdered people to to keep everybody in line uh, union wise. Joey McGreal. Uh, who was a, a Irish mob guy fighting over one of the unions in the early seventies. And uh, so they were all kind of working 
together, Bruno, Natali, Scarfo, uh, Long John Moderano was, was very close to uh, Bruno at that time, even though he wasn't made. But uh, uh, I think the the biggest... Where, where does he get made? I, I, I don't want to digress too much. He gets made under Testa or Scarfo? He gets made under... I, I don't... I, he was either the first making ceremony that Testa did... Okay. The first making ceremony that Scarpo did. Okay. Whatever. Sorry to, yeah, go ahead. Keep, keep going. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Uh, So you have a situation where I I think you can trace Joe Rugnetta's death, the, the, the conciliary who Scarpo had a issue with because he wouldn't marry his daughter. The decision by, Angelo Bruno to name Tony Bananas Caponegro as conciliary, this was in the early 70s, proved a fatal mistake. And with Caponegro as the conciliary, he was out of uh, New Jersey and he was able to kind of uh, circle the horses in terms of rallying support against uh, Bruno. And this was kind of, I think, a a big strategic misstep uh, by Angelo Bruno in the early 70s when he replaced uh, Rugnetta with um, Tony Caponegro. And this all kind of, the dominoes fall in place that eventually Nicky Scarf was able to take over. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves let's go backwards for a second yeah say, because i still want to talk about atlantic city too but go ahead yeah uh but phil leonetti who eventually becomes the mafia prince and is uh nikki's sister's son uh his father uh leaves the picture when he's uh, barely out of diapers and phil's mother moves her and phil in with Nikki Scarfo and Nikki and his sister's mother, uh, Phil's uh, grandma, uh, in Atlantic City. And and Nikki Scarfo raises Phil Leonetti uh, more as a son than as a nephew. Right. Um, and, and, and there's one of the anecdotes in the book that when Phil's eight years old, Nikki uses him as a as a roost in some ways or as a as a shield uh, to to alleviate any suspicions that he's got a dead body in, in his trunk. He's got his eight-year-old nephew with him in the front seat of the car in the middle of the night. After he kills the guy, he goes home and wakes up Phil, puts him in the car to drive to where they're going to bury the body because he feels like if a cop first is thinking about pulling him over, he probably won't because he sees the kid in the car. And if he does, I can just say, oh, I'm out with my son, you know, taking a leisurely late night uh drop and i mean that's that's the kind of a lens into the sociopathy um that is nicky scarfo and what he passed on to to his nephew again who he kind of raised as a, as a son or a surrogate son so yeah i want to um address that later on too especially that that family dynamic with his own with his actual sons not not like his surrogate son phil but, but this is this is all happening in the 50s and 60s at, Atlantic City doesn't get gambling legalized until 76. I don't think the first uh, casino opens until like 78, just to give you an understanding of the time. Right. And so that, that's what, something I want to talk about, the economics of of Atlantic City, again, being in the right place at the right time. So the real money is in the unions and, and the, the, the concrete, right, the construction rackets. However... There are a number of other lucrative opportunities in this environment. Obviously, loan sharking. Think of all the gamblers there that <laughs> that need money, right? That's going to, going to be lucrative for Scarfo and his operation. You can now. There's going to be more bars and restaurants than before, so you can shake them down. And casinos. What goes along with with casinos other than loan sharking? People like to do dope. Yeah, and people you stay like, up all night. You got to stay up all night to gamble, <laughs> right? And people like and, and women and women. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and um, so 
there's a number of lucrative street rackets as well. So Scarfo is an interesting guy at this point because he has his hands in both sides of, of racketeering, both the construction unions and then, but also what we think of more of the street stuff, shaking people down, shaking dope dealers down. And he's, um, at, a, and he's at a comfortable distance. Yeah. It kind of, there, there's a, a semi parallel to Tony Spilatro in Chicago when he goes out to Vegas. I think Nikki Scarpo is the version of that story when it all goes right until it doesn't. Um, Spilatro was never able to climb the ladder to become boss, even though he wanted to. Um, and, and he was kind of too far away. You know, Nikki was far enough away to have a little bit of a buffer between him and, and Philly. But Spilatro was a thousand miles away on the West Coast and went to his head. But, you know, Nikki played that same role in a much smarter, more calculated, deliberate way for somebody that was known as a cowboy, just like Spilatro. Right. And, and uh, something, I wanna, uh, something else I want to raise here, which, which relates to the situation in Atlantic City, is the, the political environment that's going on in this uh, Bruno crime family. So Scarfo is holding it down in Atlantic city, but you know, who else is trying to get in on Atlantic city? It, the Gambinos, all especially the, York, the Gambinos, all the, all the families. families, but especially the, the Gambinos because they have a close relationship with Angelo Bruno. And also you can tie it to Sicily as well, because the Cherry Hill Gambinos were tied into Palermo too. And and the mafia in Sicily also was excited at this possibility of getting in on the action in Atlantic City. There's a, there's a big point that, that needs to be immediately stated for, for the audience. Yeah. A part of so the first part of Angelo Bruno's downfall, in my opinion, in in his kind of increasing, increasingly alienating himself and miscalculating. Um, policy and, and promotion. So first is is replacing Joe Regnetto with uh, Tony Bananas Caponegro. But second, and kind of part and parcel of that, and then also a tie you can make to, to Nikki Scarfo in Atlantic City, uh, Tony Bananas in Newark. Angelo Bruno didn't want to jump headfirst into Atlantic City legalized gambling. Right. He was point. happy with what was going on before legalized gambling. Uh, he almost saw it as a headache as opposed to a, a huge potential moneymaker. So that attitude didn't sit well with Nicky Scarfo, Tony Caponegro, or the guys in New York. Because um, at the same time, he, he didn't want those guys coming in either. <laughs> So right. he was almost saying, leave it alone. Let, let it be legitimate. Yeah. And that's not going to go over well with yeah. guys who are gangsters for a living. So a lot of what was going on in terms of priming the ground, I would say, for what eventually became this huge boom town in the 80s of, of uh, legalized casino gambling in Atlantic City. Uh, uh, Angelo Bruno was resistant to a lot of it. Right. and But he does... Tell the Gambinos he has no problem with the Cherry Hill Gambinos. If they're if they're if they are going to push the issue, then he's not going to stop them. So they're trying to actually get in on one of the casinos. They're blocked, but they own a discotheque back then. This is the late seventies. A discotheque. They're they're prolific drug traffickers, but they also own a number of restaurants and clubs and pizzerias in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is South Jersey, which just like Atlantic City is supposed to be Bruno territory. And my understanding is Bruno was getting a cut of the drug profits, but for the most part left the Cherry Hill Gambinos alone. And to your point, a lot of the rank and file are really getting annoyed with Bruno's laissez-faire attitude about letting the Zips and the Gambinos come in, trying to get a piece of Atlantic City, setting up shop all over the place. And and with the drug thing, especially with the drug thing, when Bruno at least um superficial and at a superficial level 
says he doesn't want his guys dealing dope, which we know is bullshit because Long John was was bringing him in a lot of a lot of dope money. A lot of and dope he was money, taking, and he was he was taking a dope money tribute from the Jerry O guy and from the Black Mafia. Yeah. Family going go, the black mafia's money, not, not BMF. I'm sorry, the Philly black mafia, the Philadelphia right. black mafia. Right. Uh, that money was coming through Long John, <laughs> who was the right. point man for the the blacks, the bikers, the Irish. I mean, he was very, very instrumental for a guy that wasn't made at that point. Right. So there's there's some hypocrisy on Bruno's part. So there is this growing frustration with his leadership style. So the reason why we're spending, you know unpacking this and spending so much time on this is Bruno's going to get killed. <laughs> I think our audience probably knows that he's going to get whacked. And, and these are the events leading up to it, which eventually is going to lead to this point where Scarfo's on top, but you want to break down some of the machinations where they actually decide to take out Bruno and also how, how, what that has to do with Scarfo. Yeah. So Scarfo and his, so his two best friends are uh, Salvatore Chucky Merlino who was Joey Merlino's dad, and then uh, Phil the Chicken Man, Testa. Um, and Testa and Scarfo were made. Chucky Merlino was not. Testa became Bruno's underboss. And even though Scarfo and Testa were not fans or actually even huge supporters of Bruno they didn't have the appetite to join a coup uh, and uh, they weren't looking to murder him that's not to be said there were not other people uh, in that same orbit that felt differently and were very eager to like I said before you know circle the horses and and rally uh, support for uh, a mutiny and Tony bananas was able to get uh, Frank, the Barracuda Sindone and Johnny, Johnny key Simone, two of the most powerful couples at that point in the crime family to join his mutiny. He goes and makes a deal with the Genovese crime family or thinks he makes a deal with yeah, the Genovese right, crime family. Right. Um, and part of that deal has to do with cutting them in on Atlantic City. He didn't realize he was being played. Uh, that that funds uh, Frank Thierry um, was basically lying to him about support from the commission that he thought that he had. He thought he had it greenlit, and he didn't. But uh, 1980, March 1980, it's you know all the. T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted and it's a full go. They're going to kill. They're going to kill the king. And they bring in a Gambino um, affiliate who had become a Philly mob soldier, John Stampa, uh, who was very. You know, he, his his relevance and his presence in Philadelphia came from the fact that when he came over from Sicily, the Gambinos placed him with Bruno. Um, but it, in reality, he was kind of like a double agent. And they used him. Normally, Long John Moderano would be uh, a driver for Angelo Bruno, but Long John couldn't uh, fulfill that job on the night of Bruno's murder. They put Stampha in there, knowing that Stampha is a part of the plot. Uh, word on the street, and I believe this, is that Tony Bananas was crazy enough to want to pull the trigger himself, <laughs> that he was not going to outsource um, this, this assassination, that he was going to actually be the one that killed Angelo Bruno, and um, a shotgun was delivered. Went from Philly to New to Newark, um, and Caponegro was delivered to Caponegro, and then Caponegro traveled to South Philly. And uh, Bruno had a had a dinner. Came home, was being driven by Stampa. Stampa un, um, 
puts the, the window down on the passenger seat of the car that, that he's driving Bruno home from. They're sitting in front of Bruno's house. Bruno goes to light up a cigarette. And Tony Bananas comes up behind him with a shotgun and blows his head off. And there's that famous photo of him sitting upright in the passenger seat, half of his head gone, yeah, and his mouth a gap. Yeah. And one of the best anecdotes that I took away from my time with, with Phil Leonetti was when he's talking about, I said, well, what was the reaction from your uncle and, and Testa when all this goes down? And he says, well, they were shook because it, it, there was all of a sudden instability in a family that had always been so stable. But he said they weren't upset that uh, someone had the balls to take Bruno out. They and and Nikki, I guess, was saying as the as the um, the image was being splashed on the uh, television set, he said him and Testa would were were and these were the in the hours and the days afterwards when they would have the television on, they would say to each other like that it's it's appropriate that uh, Bruno died with his mouth open because he was trying to take food off of everybody's plate and put it in his mouth that he was always taking taking taking. Um, so I know I know Testa really felt um, that he had lost all of his juice uh, as underboss. That even though he was supposed to be the number two in the crime family, Bruno was alienating him from decision making, um, alienating him from his from some, from some of his troops. And I know that uh, Testa was not happy with with the way that. Bruno was leading the family there, but he wasn't involved in in the conspiracy to murder. But I think it's an interesting point to make that the he was not this beloved Don where the Scarfo and Testa were going to avenge like Luca Brazzi, like going, going to avenge Don Vito, right? Like right. a year later, though, it, that that is what happened. Right, right. But 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 they're um, but I think they had different motives for that for their own like yeah establish themselves. Let me ask you something. What do you think about the the idea that Stampha wasn't in on it? That yeah, impossible. He, impossible. Yeah. Um, and and, I, and honestly, I think it played a role in him getting it tapped to be boss later on. I don't think it hurt him. <laughs> I think it might have actually helped him because well, he, he got. He, he, he does have the, to get out of Dodge at first. Right, right. He had to leave. But I'm saying when he comes back, he comes back and is installed as the boss by New York. It wasn't the people in Philly that were bringing him back and saying, we want we want you to be our boss. Right. I'm, I, I've also heard that Stamfo was already made in Sicily. Yeah, over on the other side. Yeah. yeah, on the other side. So uh, that, that complicated issues, too. And then Bruno uh, wasn't making people. He was... Uh, upsetting a lot of his capos who wanted to bring guys in to, to help the greater good in terms of bottom line and uh, wasn't able to do that. It, he was su- surrounding himself um, with a, a, with a clique of people that were also kind of, they were, it was like the, the cool kids click. Um, where guys that were around Bruno got certain treatment that other guys didn't get. And it didn't matter. Like like we're saying with, with Long John, it didn't matter. He didn't have a button, but he was able to act um, above a lot. I mean, like he was able to do things that nobody else was able to do because he had Bruno's ear. Right. And, and that kind of behavior alienated a lot of people. Um, this, he didn't this, have a ton of supporters. This Machiavellian, and Carl, let me just point out, Carlo yeah. Gambino dying, I think, plays a role in it. If Gambino's alive and he wouldn't have allowed that, it wouldn't have happened. I don't think so either. But if Stampha is part of the conspiracy, then that tells me that the the Zips and the Gambinos must have. I, I don't think he would go rogue and just no. do that because <laughs> because no, I, think they were, I think they were well aware. Wow. And the and the Genovese, like so. Yeah. There's this Machiavellian, like we're gonna wink, wink, tell you it's okay to kill the boss, but then when the shit hits the fan, we're going to be like, I don't know what you're talking. I about. I don't know what you're. Ta- I didn't tell you to do that shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think also that 
Carmine Galante's assassination less than a year before that played a minor role just empowering the insurgents. Like, hey, look, this just happened in New York. They took out a boss. Carlo Gambino's no longer there. We can take out a boss. It can be done. We don't care if it's Carlo, you know, if he was close to Carlo Gambino five years ago when when, uh, Carlo was still alive or four years ago when Carlo was still alive. Uh, I, I hate to, to to digress, but we you know we have these conversations and interesting things pop in my head. Scott's also an authority on the Toko Zerilli family. Um, Zerilli always had pretty good tie, uh, pretty good relationship with Bruno. He he's already dead by by eighty one. Well, did you did you ever get a sense what the Detroit guys thought about that? What I'll tell you. One? I'll tell you what's really interesting. That's eight in eighty uh, or in eighty one. Yeah, in eighty. The the feds had followed Jack Toko. To a meeting with Bruno, I think it was two or three weeks before Bruno wow. was killed. No shit. Uh, wow. Jack Toko took, uh, I believe, Jimmy Quasarano and one of the Corrado brothers, and they did an East Coast Godfather swing um, where they spent like a couple weeks. They started in Florida and then went to uh, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts. And, and went and 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 in the parts of Pennsylvania and uh, met with all the bosses that uh, Jack needed to be introduced to, him. and Jimmy Jimmy Q was going to do the the introductions, and I know that the meeting that he had with Bruno was in February of eighty, and uh, Bruno was killed in you know third I believe middle of March end of March, um, yeah, so. The, the Detroit family was very close to Bruno. Uh, I'm I'm sure they weren't thrilled with what happened there. I, yeah. I don't. I don't. It's interesting for you know during my research in these kinds of situations, I find that there could be a couple of different approaches. One would be this sort of like, oh shit, we we like that dude. We had good relationships with that dude. This is fucked up. What are going to be the repercussions? Could this destabilize things in our own brigada? And then and then the other view you would you might encounter from some of these guys is who gives a fuck? What, do I, what, what are, you know? It's sort of like indifferent. Like what do I give a fuck about? What but you, you didn't like you Bruno. didn't really hear about any. You heard a lot of connections between Bruno uh, and Zerilli Toko. You never, you didn't really hear about anything between Nikki Scarfo and Jack Toko. I mean, they they were polar opposites in the way no, they were running their families. I would be surprised, yeah, if, if that that were to happen. The only different, one of, totally different styles. One of the soldiers under Scarfo who ended up being a casualty of the Scarfo regime, uh, Pasquale um, Spirito, Pat the Cat, uh, when he was before he was a made guy, when he was an associate uh, under Bruno. He had uh, come to Detroit. There was some um, horse fixing going on, and the uh, the Bruno family had a piece of it. And, and Pat the Cat was was their point man, and had come to Detroit and had met with Jack Toko and those guys. But um, that's the only connection that I can make between the Scarpo era and and the Toko era, and that didn't even happen during the Scarpo era. It was in it was actually in the Bruno era when that meetup happened. Right. So back to the chronology. So New York makes it known that we didn't sanction this. So the conspirators are they're going to get killed too. Brutally. Brutally. Uh Caponegro, his uh, brother-in-law Freddie Salerno, um they were both killed together when they went to go account for what happened in front of the commission. Yes. Uh and then uh the um the New York families help out with the the hit on on John Simone, Johnny Keys, the Gambinos do it. They assign it to Sammy the Bull, who talked about it in his book, um, how they had to kind of wait wait for him in a van to see if they were going to actually kill him or not, and then he let him take his shoes off before they killed him as kind of a a, a uh, gesture of respect. Um, and then ch- allegedly. Uh, Chucky Merlino and, and Joseph Chicky Changalini kill Frank Sindon. And, and Chicky Changalini had been Sindon's right hand man and eventually took over uh, his crew. Changalini had been made under, Chicky Changalini had been made under Bruno. Chucky Merlino 
uh, wasn't made until uh, uh, the, the making ceremonies that started to occur uh, in the aftermath of Bruno's death when Testa and Scarpo started making guys at a, a pretty steady clip. We had about 30 guys, 40 guys come in, 30 guys come in in about a two, three, four year period. So Chicken Man Testa, who was the underboss, is now the boss. He was the Soto Capo. Now he's the boss. And he appoints Scarfo as his consigliere. His consigliere. Which is really interesting because Scarfo doesn't strike me as the kind of personality you want as your well, another miscalculation. Advisor. Another miscalculation. He names Pete Casella his underboss, who a guy kind of like Stanfa has a, a lot of support in New York. Um, New York, I think, was pushing for, for Casella to be the underboss instead of Scarfo. It probably would have been better to have it reversed. Mm -hmm. um, but within a year, almost to the day, uh, Bruno was killed on March 21st, 1980. I believe Tessa was killed on the 18th or 19th of March, 81. So it's almost exactly a year later. And the you know history repeats itself. Casella <laughs> circles the wagons and, and uh, drums up support for a coup. Um, from uh, mainly Chicky Narducci, I know was was uh, a capo that uh, jumped on board with Casella, and they blow Phil Testa up. Uh, Bruce Springsteen wrote a famous song about it called uh, "Atlantic City." They blew up the Chicken Man last night. They blew up his house too, and uh, uh, they put a nail bomb there, hoping to that people suspected the, the roofers union, which goes back to some of the stuff we talk about. Right. And, um, but in reality, it was, it was Casella and his brother and, and Chicky Narducci and uh, a guy um, who worked for them named uh, Rocco Marinucci, who was the guy that actually, I think planted the bomb and detonated it. Was that just a, a power grab? Or were they just taking advantage of the destabilization? Or yeah. did they, they did they not like I don't think they did I don't think they disliked that stuff. It they wasn't just wanted, they just wanted the power, yeah. It, like we're gonna take advantage of the yeah. destabilization. And 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 then so um And they but, didn't have they didn't have the, the proper sign off from New York either. So when they get called to account for it, uh Casella is protected by new york they won't let scarfo kill him they they tell him and his brother to to get out of town and you're exiled down to florida you can never come back to philadelphia but marinucci and narducci um they're marked for death and the contract for both of those guys go to chicken man testa's son who also could have been called the mafia prince uh, Salvi Testa, who was really probably in real time, he was more the mafia prince than than, than Phil was. I, I, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but uh, Salvi Testa is is given the contracts and joyously carries. He's them enthusiastic out. about it to yeah, avenge his it, father. He wanted uh, when they killed Marinucci, they put firecrackers in his mouth as a sign that he was killed because he played a role in in blowing up Phil Testa. And then with, with Chicky Narducci, te, uh, Salvi Testa told people, I, I wanted to personally see his eyes when I killed him. And that he, he it was very, very personal. And they got him coming out of uh, court. Um, he was on trial with a, with a, a lot of the Scarfo guys, including Chicky Cangolini who allegedly tipped off Salvi when they all got out of court that day and Chicky was, was driving home and then Salvi met him uh, when he was pulling up in front of his, uh, the, Salvi met him in the street and, and unloaded his clip into him and, and said, I, I wanted to see the whites of his eyes. I wanted him to know that I was the one that was, that was killing him. Um, it's, it's, that's some pretty heavy stuff, man. And, and it just got, more Shakespearean and more, more bloodlust and, and more dysfunction as, as the eighties went on. And again, it, it, it was a one eighty from 
where that family was from, you know, the fifties to 1980, where you didn't have any, um, real chinks in the armor in terms of the, the integrity of the structure. You didn't have the internal conflict. I mean, Bruno yeah. would kill whack people out, but you didn't have the internal conflict. So my understanding, you correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is at this point, Scarfo gets permission from the, or the commission basically anoints Scarfo. Okay. Yeah. You're the boss. Now you're in charge of Philadelphia, yeah. especially the Genovese. I think they were, he was particularly close to them. He was close with Bobby Manna. Yeah, more okay. more so than the other four families, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, that's where his power came from. And uh, Casella and some other guys uh, were trying to declare themselves boss in the wake of this. And Scarfo had to go, I think, I, I, at least two meetings. He had to go to New York to clear things up. And Casella was coming to the guys in Philly saying that the guys in New York are saying X, Y, and Z. And Nikki Scar was like, I'm not just going to take your word for it. I'm going to go meet with these people myself. Mm -hmm. And he found out that's not what they were saying. Um, and he wasn't allowed to kill Casella, which I still find that the fact that Stampa and Casella were involved in these huge unsanctioned mob, mob assassinations, and they were both able to walk away from it just because they were, um, you know, they had co-signage from, from the five families. Yeah, I want to also take a moment here. We the, the Stampa, I was having a conversation about the Stampa, whether he was implicated or not with our friends over <laughs> at the um, Mob Archaeologist. Well, check out their channel on YouTube if you get a chance. They, they, they put out um, an episode on Philadelphia um, a while back that I know is pretty popular, so uh shout out to them they're good friends of ours and actually we're we're gonna plan more crossover episodes with them i know they're not releasing content as frequently as they would like they're busy with other things but anyhow back to the 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 chronology so what's interesting here is okay scarfo is anointed the boss and you would think okay well finally there's going to be some stability here right but it's anything it's anything but right anything but stable under scarfo so then Right when Star when Scarfo takes power, he has resistance from kind of a family within the family, or a, a, a very powerful crew. Uh, Harry the Hunchback Riccobini went all the way back. Uh, you know, to, he was a real old time. Yeah, to the, almost to the turn of the century, he got his button when he was like seventeen or eighteen, um, and was allowed to kind of do his own thing under Bruno as long as he sent uh, a Christmas package. But Bruno took a real hands-off approach with him. And he, like I said, he kind of created his own family within a family. And uh, he was one of the people that wanted to be boss in the aftermath of uh, both Bruno and uh, Testa's assassinations. And when that wasn't a possibility, uh, him and Nikki Scarfo knew each other very well. I mean, they had, uh, this wasn't like a, yeah, this wasn't like enemies from a distance, you know, like Marlo Stanfield and Avon Barksdale. Yeah, uh, right. these were guys that had had been with each other for uh, you know, thirty years at that point, uh, thirty forty years in terms of working together. And he was over. actually born in Harry Cabini. I'm looking at his FBN file right now. He was actually born in Sicily. I didn't, mm -hmm. I, if I didn't know that, I, I can't remember if I knew that or not, or if I forgot. But and it says his associates, Pete Casella, Joe Rugnetta. Um, among others. So, uh, you know, this is from like the 1950s. Just yeah. to give you an idea of how, how far he went back, he was born in 1909. So, um, and if he was made at 17, you know, he was made during prohibition. Yeah, but the, the, the reason why I, I'm, you know, overemphasizing his his age and he he's born in Sicily is th it gives you some context for his attitude of like, I don't need to recognize Scarfo yeah. as the boss. I'm a fucking OG. Around here, and he looked like Santa Claus. He was about <laughs> five foot two with this big white beard and crazy white hair, um, but had a lot of loyalists and was fearless and refused to come under uh, Scarfo. So Scarfo ordered him and his whole crew, uh, you know, ordered their murders and gave the contracts to Salvi Testa, who became 
you know, his his number one kind of general on the street to fight these wars. Um, and Salvi got uh, wounded in that conflict. They tried, right, they tried to kill him. They tried to, the Rick yeah. faction tried to take out Salvi. So between like 82 and 83, there's this internal blood feud uh, war going on between uh, Harry Riccobini and his brothers and, and their faction. And then, you know, the Scarfo regime with, with Salvi Testa uh, leading that, uh, that, uh, that, that charge to, to eliminate the entire Riccobini faction. Yeah, so they they actually shoot back, right? They they try yeah. to take out some of Scarfo's guys. When well, they kill Frank Monte, they kill yeah, Frank Monte. I was going to say, I thought they took out one of one of at least one they of took Scarfo's out guys. they took out Scarfo's conciliary. Okay, right, which was a uh, big 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 win Frank, for them. Yeah, but. Frank Monte, and then he replaces um, he replaced Frank Monte with his with his uncle Nicky Buck uh, Piccolo as as his conciliary at that point. But uh, it, it was. It was quite uh, intense in 82, 83. Um, and it ends had, not because the not because Scarfo gets a decisive victory. Doesn't it end because Rico Beanie and some of his guys go to pr- end up going yeah, to prison? Yeah, they went to prison. Ricky Beanie ends up surviving a, a number of hits, one inside of a phone booth when <laughs> uh, John uh, Salvatore Grande, who they all called uh, Wayne, which was short for John Wayne because he was such a cowboy, uh, or Wayney, uh, caught. Uh, Rick Abini in a phone booth and unloaded an automatic weapon into him and didn't uh, didn't kill him. So yeah, he goes to jail and then Scarpo has to go to jail and serve uh, about a year on a gun case. When they when they arrest him, they found a, a or when, when they I, I don't remember exactly where that gun case came from, um, but he had to go do. I know it was on some type of uh, uh, search. Um, and he had to go to Texas to go do, uh, I think 14, 14 months and Chucky Merlino, you know, holds down the ship, crazy Phil Leonetti, his nephew holds down the ship. Um, we were talking off air, you know, uh, Phil did not like the nickname, uh, crazy Phil, the media gave it to him, some radio, um, reporter. And he used to complain about it a lot. And his uncle would would chastise him for complaining and say, "Well, are you out of your mind? People yeah. would pay. People would pay for a nickname like that." He's like, yeah. "You should. You should embrace it. You should love it." People call me Little Nicky. I hate that nickname. I wish I was. I wish I was uh, crazy, crazy Nicky. Nicky. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, that was a that was a fun thing uh, in your book. So let me ask you about the chronology here. Is it really, this- it really, the nickname really belies who Phil was though. I mean, Phil was not a, you know, hair trigger temper or uh, impulsive or erratic, you know, Tony bananas, Caponegro was, and that's why he was nicknamed bananas. Tony bananas. Well, that's one of the things that you can, that, that you can, you know, pull from, from your text yeah. is that, that Phil, this is part of the anxiety and the stress on Phil is because he is in a lot of ways, a contrast, not to say he wasn't, a person he would trifle with. He was a stone cold gangster too, but he didn't, he wasn't the sort of cowboy that his uncle was. And he didn't, you can, have, blood, he didn't have bloodlust. He didn't have, he, did. he didn't have bloodlust. He right? didn't, he didn't get off on it. Nikki got off on it. I mean, well, let's, let's talk about, so when does, when's the, um, speak, cause this is a, you know, something that is a really striking example. The Falcone murder. When is that? Is that, that's, that's before Bruno. That's 79. Okay, so well, it's a little bit out of chronology, but you want to talk because that's one of the most striking examples of Scarfo's pathology. Yeah, he decided uh, that this acquaintance of theirs, uh, Vincent Falcone, who worked in the construction business with them, I think he was involved in some some small rackets. Uh, wasn't a big gangster, but definitely wasn't a civilian either. And uh, he was uh, vocal in his. Dislike of Nicky Scarfo. He was running around town telling everyone that uh, Scarf Inc. did uh, shoddy work. And and Nicky decided to kill him and told his nephew, Phil, told uh, Joey Merlino's uncle, Chucky Merlino's brother, Yogi Merlino. And then a civilian um, in, 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 in a guy named Joe Salerno. 
And th- again, this this demonstrates uh, the way that these guys think. And, and in some ways, I'm I'm surprised that. Well, let's just they wanted Salerno there because in their mind it would lower Vince Falcone's guard. Yeah, they, they wouldn't kill him in front of a civilian. In front of a civilian. Time. Right. Um in some ways, Joe Salerno was lucky they didn't just kill him right after they killed Falcone. Yeah. They let him live, and that's how they got caught up uh, you know, facing first degree homicide charges. Right. They tried to kill his dad. Yeah, to shut him up. To shut him up. Uh, they shot his dad in the head. His dad survived, but um, it se- that seems like a wasn't the best move in the world. But uh, they kill uh, Falcone at Nikki Scarfo's place, and uh, uh, Leonetti uh, put two in the back of his head when he when he offered to go buy uh, get him a drink in the kitchen, and. Nikki was so high from the murder that he said, I, I wish I could bring him back to life and kill him again. <laughs> kill him again. <laughs> and then when they uh when they sent uh some of the guys that were involved in the conspiracy out to go get equipment to bury the body, they came back and Nikki was in the living room like drunk uh, out of his mind like celebrating like they said there were a fo- it was a football game on on uh on television the body sprawled out on the carpet <laughs> nikki's downing fifths of vodka in cutty sark um and and kind of uh literally dancing on this guy's corpse uh it was it's it's very um visceral and i think it 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 demonstrates perfectly uh how unhinged and um lethal and uh you know, psychopathic Nikki Scarfo is. Well another dramatic murder I want to talk about and you you've explained the chronology. Um we we we've talked about the this the civil war with the Riccobini faction. What about when Scarfo makes this decision to take out the Greek there was a Greek mobster, a, a, a crew of Greek mobsters. They killed, they killed two of them. And, and this is back to the same thing of like, Scarfo says there's a new sheriff in town, to use a cliche, whereas Bruno was very laissez-faire with Rico Bini, the Terry Hill Gambinos, Black Mafia, Greeks. Scarfo says, the, the pagans. It's all Scar- mine. Scarfo all mine. says, right, I want a piece no, of it every, all. Right. Everyone has to. It, it reminds you of the uh, King of New York scene where, where yeah. Christopher Rock says, I don't, if a nickel bag is sold, yeah. if, a, if a, you know, any kind of bet this, is made, I this want Christmas <laughs> tribute bullshit doesn't fly <laughs> right. with me. I don't want once a year. I want once a month. <laughs> right. Right. And so the, the, the Greeks, you know, just like Riccobini, right, are like, uh, we're not no. going to do it. Yeah. So now, they, when does they, that is that before the Riccobini or was it simultaneous? It's around or? the same time. Around the same time. Okay. Um, 80, uh, 82, 83. Okay. Um, and uh, then you had the situation with Salvi, which was really the the beginning of the end. Um, it it, it started off as like we're going to kill. I mean, in terms of the Nikki Scarfo regime, we're going to kill people responsible for. Phil Tessa's assassination. And that quickly became, we're going to kill anybody that we have any issue with at any time. Right. And it started to, the bodies were piling up. I mean, you went from an era where you probably had a half dozen mob murders in Philadelphia to a two year period or three year period where you had two dozen from a half a dozen. Yeah, so walk us through the 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 murder of um, Boris. Was that his name, Stevie Boris, the Greek guy? Yeah, you know what? I, I don't uh, off the top of my head. I don't have the the uh, the stuff in front of me, the specifics of it. But, well, this uh, like they shoot they shoot at killing him at the restaurant. And- they caught him at the restaurant. Raymond Longjar Matarano uh, allegedly set him up. He was there with his. They were all there with their wives. Uh, two masked uh, gunmen who nobody's ever been uh, charged with. With those homicides, Boris's, I believe, was the the, the last one, and um, I think that, I think a guy named Petros, Harry Petros, was the first one. 
Um, it says, I'm just, this is, take it for what it is. This is wiki. <laughs> so take it. I, my students would be mortified. I, I yell at my students, don't cite wiki. And here I am. Um, May 27th, 1981. That's the, 81, so, right. that's the, at least that's what wiki says. So. so that's right after that's, you know, two months after, uh, two months after, uh, Testa is murdered. So I'm sorry to, for not ha- for not having my uh, dates uh, yeah. more uh, in order here. No, that's I guess right. I didn't realize that we were gonna. I, I mean, I knew we were gonna deep dive, and I, I should have been more prepared. I well, I, I you know I like to think of this as a conversation, and yeah. um, you know I, I I view my role in this as this is field research. I like to learn from Scott. I like to learn from the guests that we have on. We interview people in the underworld, people in law enforcement, best selling authors, other scholars. And I, I view it as field research. I like to look. I, I like to learn from 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 people. Um, I've never claimed that I can come on this podcast and and be a fucking computer. And and I'm I'm saying this because, you know, there's there was comments about our Westies episode. I got the, the I forgotty thing. I, I was wrong about that. That had that had nothing. That that was a different case. I was connecting it to the to the Irish, the Irish right. guy. It was a different case. And, you know, so people are piling on the comments. I don't fucking know, man. I'm not a fucking walking, I'm not a fucking walking computer, right? I'm a theoretical criminologist. So if we don't get all the fucking dates right, like get over it. Watch another show if that if that bothers you. But um, <laughs> I don't think that's what we're here for. If it, Sometimes Scott knows that shit more than I do. And he gets it right most of the time with the dates. But if if sometimes either neither one of us know, like, just get over it, I would say. <laughs> but uh, the one thing I, I'll point out with the one thing, one of the things I'll point out about Stevie Boris and and we're not going to get into a whole thing about what was going on in the 2000s. But that Stevie Boris murder ended up uh, w- with the murder of a, a woman named Jeanette Curro, who was related uh, to a, a a man who would eventually become conciliary of the Philadelphia mob and Joe Crutch, Joe Crutch Curro. And I don't think that helped uh, Raymond Longjar Moderano when he came out of prison in the 2000s and was button heads with Uncle Joe Legambi, that, that Uncle Joe Legambi's top advisor already has an issue um, with Long John from the way that that all went down 30 years before. Well, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought 20, that up. I guess it, it was like 20 years. I'm glad you brought that up because it does. I think one of the reasons why I think it's interesting to talk about Nicky Scarfo and his reign rise and fall is because the ramifications ripple through the years. It doesn't, it doesn't end when he is convicted. And he wants to kill and and he starts, in prison. And Nicky starts wanting to kill all of his own guys. These weren't enemies of his. These, yeah. these weren't like rival factions like the Riccobinis or even the, the Greeks. Well, let's let's so let's then let's jump to the Salvi Testa situation, because that's another striking example of the bloodlust and a, a, a miscalculation and something that I really think it's the turning. It was the turning point, the turning point. Yeah. So that's when it, it's the beginning of the end. Um he decides, He's a loyalist. Selvi Test is a, uh, he was Testa a was as, loyalist too. As, as rock solid as you could come in terms of his loyalty to Nikki. Uh, Nikki was uh, his father's best friend. He, he had promised that they had promised each other if either one of them dies that they would look after uh, that Phil Testa would look would, would look after Phil Leonetti and and Nikki's biological kids, and that Nikki be, would be responsible for looking after. Salvi and, and Nikki always looked at Salvi as a son in the same way that he looked at, at Phil Leonetti. But Phil Leonetti wasn't getting the press at that time that Salvi was. Phil was not a nightclub guy. He was not a flashy guy. Um, he wasn't a guy that was. If he had to do mafia business, he did it and then he went home. Uh, Salvi Testa was a was a was a good time. Charlie type, um, the son and, of Corleone, like right. he was the mafia. He was, you're right. He was the mafia prince of Philadelphia at that time. Yeah, and that's um, a great picture. Thank you, Benny, for putting that's that. him and, and his dad. Check uh, him out. Yeah, that's a great. And, and Salvi, yeah. Salvi was, you know, out of central casting of what you would want in a up and coming um, 
crime boss. He had charisma. He was, he was smart. Fear, he was fearless. He was smart. Um, he was ru- he had rugged, 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 good looks. Um, his dad was was far from a matinee idol. Yeah. Um, but but Salvi was actually a very handsome, handsome man that that the lady loved. Um, and like I said, he wasn't just on the nightclub scene in Philly. He'd traveled to New York. So the tabloids started to write about him. People in Philly, you know, gravitated towards him. And and Nikki's gone from from both Atlantic City and, and South Philly for over a year. And he starts to get insecure. And at this point, Salvi's engaged to be married to Chucky Merlino's daughter, Joey Merlino's sister. And uh, I think within this drama, the decision by Salvi to break off that engagement like a week or two before the wedding um, was another key event that laid the groundwork for for his demise and and uh, help Nikki parlay this insecurity uh, into getting people behind this notion that they had to kill Salvi because Salvi was getting um, too ambitious, which wasn't true. I mean, from everyone I've talked, Salvi had no yeah no desire to to move Nikki out and take over. Uh, he was very happy being Nikki's junkyard dog and being his muscle and being a capo. Um, but Nikki was convinced that, that he was plotting against him. I think a lot of it was paranoia. Nikki was drinking a lot at this, at this point. What do you um, make of the allegations that Salvi did have some people on the street that didn't like, even though he was for the most part, very popular, that there were some people who didn't like him who were whispering and sort of he, Scarfo already had this pre-existing paranoia yeah. point well taken, but they, but they were, Sort of adding fuel to the fire, like well, they, there was a, know, a, je- a jealousy factor, and uh, jealousy, we, yeah, good point. We yeah, want right. his rackets factor, yeah, yeah, um, right. He had a lot of rackets, a lot so, of successful rackets. So there were and, there were some people kind of feeding into Scarfo's already paranoid. Attitude. So Scarfo comes home, I believe it's March of '84, and all the the news television news stations in Philly are there to meet him. Uh, Phil Leonetti and. Um, Salvi and I believe the Merlino brothers, uh, Joey's dad and uncle, travel to Texas to pick him up. They spend the night at a hotel after he gets released in Texas. They party. Then they come home. The plane lands at uh, the Philadelphia airport and they're met by the cameras and they get him. It's not not a perp walk because they weren't arrested, but they get him coming off the plane all the way till they get into the limo to leave. It's cool footage. And uh, it's eerie to think that six months from then, this guy that's carrying Nikki's baggage, opening the door for Nikki, you know, it's raining. He's, he has the umbrella. Um, the guy that was as close to him as a son could be. And you're looking at this and you can see it. You can see Salvi. And, it, and it's not like there's no um, animosity in Salvi's uh, on Salvi's expressions that he's getting Nikki's door or carrying Nikki's luggage. It's he, he's doing it. it ostensibly it looks like he's doing it because he wants to do it. Because he well, I think so. He, he wants like to show father respect. Figure. Right, he right. wants to show um and that quickly devolves like again like what, what I said about uh how, how something happened within um you know Jack Toko met with Angelo Bruno in February and within a couple weeks Bruno's dead. Within a couple weeks of that footage the 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 marriage or the wedding is called off, and Chucky Merlino is very offended. They had put a lot of money into this wedding. It was going to be it was like a royal wedding. You were marrying right. the two most powerful. You were marrying a, a a groom and a bride from the two most powerful families in the Philadelphia mafia. They were both good looking. They were both well spoken. They they represented very well, like a uh, Prince William and, and King yeah. Kate Middleton type. Um, they had even gotten, I believe, they had booked Stevie Wonder to uh, to perform. So this was they were rolling out the red carpet. 
So not only did Chucky lose money on the money he put out for the wedding, he he took it as a slap in the face. Like, my daughter's not good enough for you. Right. And Salvi was in love with his girlfriend um, who wasn't Maria Merlino. And uh, Scarfo used Chucky Merlino's embarrassment and anger as a an, an an entry point to to get the support that he felt like he needed to order that. And the, when I say the support, I mean his underboss, who said, "Yes, I'm okay with it. You you can kill my wh- who was going to be my future son-in-law." Yeah. So. He actually gave him a kiss of death. Right. There was actually a, a some type of wake or, or wedding in the summer of, of uh, 84 where Chucky Merlino you know, gave Salvi a, a big kiss on the lips. So we know that Scarfo is giving the order, but but then how does it go down where they, they you know, they get. Well, they stalk, they stalk, they stalk him. They stalk him. Uh, Salvi for for months, you know. And Salvi, have, if correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't he have? He has a sense at this point that things are soured, right? Doesn't yeah, he that's have a why sense? He, he's yeah, looking he's over low. his shoulder. Yeah. yeah, he's laying low. Right. And after you know a number of uh, hit teams unsuccessfully stalk him, Nikki Scarfo calls his best friend in, uh, Joey Punch, and says, "You're the you're the one who's going to do it because you're the only one that can they they can get him out uh, in the open." Um, and Joe Punch had some issue uh, where he needed Salvi to come and and uh, speak for him at a sit down. And Punch said to him, "You know, uh, I need you to come to the. Uh, it was a, a a candy shop in South Philly uh, for the sit down. And I believe Salvi was either on his way back or his way to playing tennis." Um. And he walked in the candy store, and I believe it was uh, Wayne Grandy, John Wayne Grandy again, who uh, pulled the trigger. Was Nikki the Crow in on that one too? Did you? Did you? They were all in. They were all in. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this was like a a, a big conspiracy where you had a multiple people over a three or four month three or four month period planning this. This this was a, a contract that was greenlit, I believe, in May. And they didn't get him until uh, September or October. And what's interesting about this case study is a lot of the times these guys approach things in a very cold way where like, hey, it's just a call. It's just a part of doing business. You kill a guy. I'm not going to lose that sleep over. It. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But in this case, my understanding is that that this this that wasn't the approach that nobody felt good about this, including the conspirators, the guys that carried this out. Nobody felt good about it. When and Joey Punch um, said, I'll do it, but that. I can't pull the trigger. Yeah. So they didn't. So they, this was one of the few times where the guys were like, I think it was sort of, I don't think they really were hiding well, they knew either that they, that they didn't feel comfortable about this. Well, they weren't hiding it amongst each other. No, no, but they were, I, yeah, they were hiding it. Scarfo, right. They, you know they were, they were hiding it from Scarfo. They weren't hiding yeah. it amongst each other. Among, right. That they didn't feel right, good right, about right. what happened. Right. Right. They knew if they challenged Scarpo and said maybe this isn't a good idea, he would just kill them the next Did day. He, right, just kill them. He just kill them um, too. because I'm telling you, he started to kill everybody. He was killing all of his own guys, and and he would uh, call meetings and he would get up in front of the meeting and said, I- "I'm going to get rid of all you guys. I'm going <laughs> to have a hit team come in from New York." Murder every one of you and start from scratch. I mean, he would say that. Right. It reminds you of The Departed when uh, yeah. Jack Nicholson's character says, yeah, usually in these circumstances, I just kill my own crew, my whole crew right. and start over. Um, but 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 there are there is a change in attitude, right? You said the turning point because on the street, certainly everyone's afraid of Scarfo. But wouldn't you say that he does the morale is at an all time low? Yeah, well, that's it point. starts it starts to go. You know, it's a tipping point, and everyone says, "Well, if he can turn on Salvi, he can kill Salvi. He'll he'll do it to any one of us." Right, right. Um, and he was trying to. Yeah, but he does before there can be any kind of opposition to him. I don't know if there would have been, but it doesn't matter because Scarfo is going to start facing a lot of legal. Trouble. So if we could kind of walk through that because this is really the beginning of the end. Well, because he well, 
uh, Tommy Dell flips, Nikki Crow flips. Um, they find out that uh, they got the, the mayor of Atlantic City in their pocket, Mike Matthews. Um, and it's just a matter of time before the hammer's going to drop and an indictment's going to be filed. So the, the indictment came down in March of 87. Um, around 85, 86, he demotes Chucky Merlino and promotes his nephew, Phil Leonetti, to be an underboss. I think just like with Sammy the Bull, Phil and Sammy were both underbosses, but they weren't underbosses really for that long mm-hmm. when you consider you know, what, what they're kind of known for now. Right. Like, uh, d- Phil was only underboss for, I think, d- two, you know, less than two years. But even before he was underboss, he was a, he was a, I, I would say, a, a quote unquote Kingsman capo. Well, he's uh, another one who was really upset about what happens to Selvi. Yeah, but there's some debate about that. And I want to clarify, I think there are people. Really? That, I, I didn't. Well, that's Nick, well, Nikki Crow uh, has said in interviews as well as in Blood and Honor that uh, Leonetti was was walking around telling people, you know, why aren't you killing this guy? I, I, I can't I can't see his face anymore. It, I need you to kill this guy. I, I, I'm I'm so disturbed when I when I see him is what uh, Phil would tell people allegedly. Mm. Phil denies that. And, you know, I, I say, you know, even if Phil says and I believe him. Phil says, you know, Salvi was like a brother to me, you know. Right. That was the tipping point for Phil, too. If he can turn on, on Salvi, he can turn on me. Yes. Um, so do I think it's possible that Phil Leonetti made some comments during that summer because of the stress and anxiety that he was under that might have been taken as him wanting this murder to, to, to take place sooner than later? Just get it over with but I don't think that necessarily means that that there was malice or ill will there. Right. I think it was like, I just want this whole thing done because it's inevitable. Yeah. He wasn't. But I think you would also argue, just like with a lot of these, you know, a lot of people ask me, kind of people that don't study the life. Why would Salvi stay around? You know, you're you're marked for death. Why don't get on a plane? Go to Ocho's Rios. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's just again, it's just not in these guys' DNA to run. And this is the life they chose, and and uh, they they kind of I think come to terms with the fact that their lives are probably not going to end in a, in a very pretty fashion. Well, and it's also kind of this chess game because. You know, no one's going to come out right to his face and tell him, you, you know, they're going to kill you. So then there's always this kind of calculation like, well, what if what if it's not true? And then how how does it look if I just if I just bail? And then, you, you know, it's it's very complicated social, psychological. Yeah. And then with Joey Plunge, I know <clears throat> in the in the about three years uh, between Salvi's murder and the indictment, you know, there were guys that would. Um, poke at uh joey punch and whenever joey punch would walk into a bar sometimes people would go into the jukebox and uh play that's what friends are for mm. uh you know it was that hit song uh yeah yeah I remember, that cheesy yeah. hit song with like elton john and stevie wonder and gladys knight and um they would play that as like a as a knock on joey punch like you know you shouldn't have done that but if you're Joey Punch, it's like, well, you know, I, I should have swallowed a bullet. Right. Yeah, you're in a tough, you're in a tough situation. So back to the indictment. So um one thing I want to mention, I know this is this is turning into a little bit of a longer episode, but that's okay. I mean, I think Scarfo is worthy of that. Part of it is the the Penn's landing shakedown, right? Which is if you're familiar with that area of Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia, South Jersey, Penn's Landing is um this um, important like commercial center there on the water. And there was a big uh, developer. I can't remember his name. The guy that was, yeah, that I can't was remember his name it. either, but, it, but Nikki Crow was the point was running point on it. Right. And 
Um, my my understanding is that this this developer was a pretty much a straight guy, like, and so I think they, it was Rouse. I think his name was Rouse. And they and the uh, back to Scarfo's like hubris, where like nobody is exempt from being shaken down. Scarfo finds out about the project; it's lucrative, and so they say, "Okay, you know, we're going to extort this guy and get a piece of this." Well, he goes to the FBI, and right. uh, does he wire up? I can't remember. I've read Blood and Honor. Yeah, they, I've read, and, I've and, read and, your yeah, book, but I can't remember all the. You know, they flipped Nikki Crow. They, okay, Tom, when Nikki Crow and Tommy Dell flipped, it, it's game set match, and those guys were were integral, integral cl- uh, cogs in in Nikki's uh, mob machine. And but he, but know, once they once they were debriefing, yeah, it's it's, it's like I said, it's it's uh, checkmate. But initially, he's. If, if I'm correct, he was convicted of extortion. And then while he was serving his sentence, that's when they they bring RICO charges and murder charges against him, which yep. is to the point where we get where he's eventually a, a lifer. So you want to want to talk about that? Because that gets into when when Phil. Well, you, well you're talking about uh, Nikki or you're talking about you're talking about Nikki Scarfo or Nikki Carmondi? Nikki Scarfo, like Scarfo is convicted on extortion charges for the okay, but, landing thing. OK, but. I'm not I'm not arguing your chronology, but the indictment that came down in March of 87, which was related to the traditional Rico case, is what swept him off the street. I'm not saying that the chronologically the chronological order of his case of his cases that went in front of a jury that he wasn't first convicted of an extortion case. But it's not like he was indicted on extortion was off the streets was in jail and got indicted for a wreck oh oh you're saying yeah so i don't know that i don't know that i'm saying in march of 87 it. everybody got swept off the street from from the the scarpa regime oh so that was already out there that that big rico indictment. the rico case dropped in march of 87 like i said okay. i don't know what the chronolo- uh, the chronological order is of I some see. of the other cases sure. because i know you're right there were other cases that either spawned off of or were before. Yeah. Um, but everybody was on the street until March of 87. Okay. Okay. Um, with not Nikki and Tommy Dell, Nikki Caramondi and Tommy Dell were, uh, were, were, were jammed up in, in the years before that, which laid the foundation for the March 87. So when did the murder charges come into March, play? Here March because- 87. March okay. 87 was the big okay. Rico case with all the murder comes. Okay. Um, and then where does Phil fit into this in terms of his decision to cooperate? Phil's indicted. Phil's convicted at trial with Nikki in '89, and then a couple weeks after their conviction at trial, and Phil's looking at a life sentence. He flips. And talk to us about. I mean, we want people to read your book, and you can find it in more detail. But if you can just give us the brief synopsis of his kind of thought process about about doing that was it just i don't want to spend the rest pragmatic. Of my life in jail. Yeah, being pragmatic okay and I, I think that if uh if they hadn't been indicted in march of 87 and they would have continued on with the with the, the scarper regime as it was into the summer of 87 i think uh, phil would have led a mutiny of his own um and and murdered nikki uh with the full support of everybody in that family yeah, so when um, when Scarfo is convicted and and sent away, um, and he's going to be a lifer, um, he tries to hold on to the family from prison. Uh, tell talk to us about the the politics. Well, he of that put his he put his uncle uh, Tony Buck, a uh, Piccolo, as the acting boss. It lasted uh, for about three years. Not a ton of activity going on I, at that point. You did have Joey Merlino and Mikey Cangellini starting to plant the seeds for what would happen in the 90s. Uh, but then Joey had to go away in 89 for his armored car. Uh, ice. And at that point, Tony Buck doesn't want the job. Nikki's convicted and, is, and there's no chance that he's ever coming home. They needed a boss. And, and New York installs Stampa. I mean, it, it wasn't something where the Philly guys were like, hey, John, we really need you to come and save the day. Uh, New York put him in there and he was able to to get some guys that uh, he had known from back in the 70s. Uh, Little Felix, uh, Bacchino and, and some of those guys 
to jump behind him. Uh, Al Pajamas, uh, Vince Pagano, um, Shotzi, uh, Sparaccio. And but but Nick by by ninety Nikki's out of the boss seat. But Scarfo's son is a made guy in the family, and is he? Is no, he, he's not. He's not. Oh, he's, he's not made. He, no, he is made, but he's not made in the Philadelphia model. Oh, I thought he transferred to the Lucases. He never. He never was. He a never made got. A button. He never got okay. a button in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, and and then Nikki arranged for him to get made uh, in, in the Lucases. So so he's not. An option for Scarfo to hold on to power, then. Yeah, he hadn't made him. Okay. And then Joey Merlino tried to kill him, allegedly. Right, right. On uh, Halloween. Halloween 89. Um, they, he survived that attack. And, you know, like I said, Joey Merlino was very close to the Scarfos. And then when his dad got demoted, uh, he was chased out of South Philly. Um, he, he felt like, Scarfo wanted to kill him and his dad. I mean, yeah. I, I, don't think, I don't think that's a stretch either. Yeah. And, um, and and do we have insight into Scarfo's attitude when he's, I mean, so he's in prison for a long time while all this is playing out and he, he doesn't take it very well, does he? That he's basically. No. <laughs> Persona non grata. Well, in his mind, he was plotting to take the family back right. for decades behind bars. I mean, that's how out of touch and disconnected this guy was that he thought through his connecting to Vic Amuso, who was the imprisoned boss of the Lucchese, and through his son, uh, Nicky Scarfo Jr., who was, I guess he was a capo at some point in the Lucchese, uh, that they could fleece this bank, take the money that they fleeced from the bank, and then, I guess, pay off the commission, or, or what's left, of, you know, right. I don't know if it was the commission, but Pay off the New York Dons, yeah, the the uh, class as a way to to push. I guess at that point, Legambian Merlino out of power uh, and install his his son. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but that was I mean, that was all made into a court file. That that was what the plan was well, when his son got busted. Uh, I know they had reached out to Joey Chang, uh, who had been Stampa's underboss, and, and wanted to bring him in. In, in on the on the conspiracy, so I mean, you just had this harebrained scheme that that Nikki was uh, plotting, in, you know, into his eighties. And I also tell you, I think I've said it on this show before, when he got the Mafia Prince book in his hand, he had a cardiac arrest. I mean, wow. literally, it, it sent him to the hospital when he looked at it. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember hearing that from you. He didn't take that very well. And, and so, and when I, when does he die? I uh, died. Um, Night was it 2019? Yeah, it wasn't that it wasn't that wasn't that long ago. So, what would you say to wrap up? What what is his legacy when we think about the Philadelphia crime family, the Italian mafia in that area, region, South Jersey, Philadelphia? What's Scarfo's legacy? Would you say? Uh, he, he died in 17. Scarfo died six, six, yeah. six years six years ago. Yeah. What would you say his legacy is? Um, his his legacy is is a trail of bodies <laughs> and, and uh, just, I, I don't think you can debate that in the last half of the 20th century, the most lethal uh, unhinged and dangerous mafia boss in America was Nicky Scarfo. I mean, he, 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 he ordered over 30 murders in five years. Um, you know, murder was his his the way to solve every problem. And uh, like I said, it wasn't it wasn't business. It was business. It was personal. It was a way for him to uh, kind of get his jollies. He fed off of it. Well, he was. So I think he was. Twi- he was very twisted and warped. I think that's part of the legacy. Something we didn't mention is that. He had another son who, who I believe Nikki wanted him to be like the heir apparent, but he just didn't have the constitution for it. He, he my understanding is he didn't want to be in that life, yep, and so he 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 tries to kill himself. And my understanding is that Nikki Scarfo did not sh- demonstrate a lot of empathy no, about he that. Thought he was weak. He thought it was weak. Yeah, which is really sad. Um, and I think well, one thing I want to credit Phil for. I mean, first of all, I can't thank the guy enough for allowing me to write his book. I mean, sure. Yeah, it's I'll be forever cool. in debt to, to Phil and. 
and his, his close friend, Chris Graziano, who was my co-author, you know, they made it possible for me to, to have my kind of magnum opus of my career and to, to um, allow, you know, kind of punch my ticket to report about Philly and write about Philly. Because it, it was really what sparked my entire interest in this whole genre was reading George Anastasia uh, when I was in law school. Yeah, this was George's book that I held up earlier, Blood and Honor. This was the first Philly book I ever read. It's it's but still a classic. I, I think... Phil's legacy is is almost more important when you contextualize it. Uh, well, I maybe not his legacy, but where he, where where he is today as compared to where he was uh, thirty five years ago. Phil is perfectly happy and content with being a regular schnook. You see at the at the end of the movie Goodfellas, where he said, "I got to live my whole life as just a regular schnook," and he's saying it as a negative. Right. The Henry Hill character, Ray Liotta in the movie. Yes. But Phil is the only former major crime lord shot caller that I've ever been with. And I've been with dozens, um, at least three or four LCN bosses, um, some underbosses and conciliaries, uh, a lot of African-American drug kingpins, guys that were biker bosses. um, And almost to a person every one of them would change places with their older version self or their older version self in the blink of an eye if they could they can yeah. go back to the to time the they they had the the power and the light they yeah were. they miss Phil's it Phil's the only one that has no affinity for it um doesn't want to revel in it or take pleasure in it you know him him uh you know his interviews for the from when we wrote, wrote the book, were very matter of fact. He's incredibly intelligent and well spoken and articulate. And, and I, I I commend that that he he's he's left that behind him, and he's he loves just being a regular ordinary guy who can go have dinner with his wife and take a walk on the beach and go see a movie and go bowling and go right play eighteen holes of golf and doesn't uh, long for the days of, of killing people and, and hanging out at uh, casinos and clubs and, um, you know, playing cards outside of uh, the Bada Bing or whatever. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, set, set tree house. So, and to, to, to your point about his, um, where he's at in his life right now, people on social media contact us a lot and ask us, why haven't we interviewed Phil Leonetti? And I think to your point, part of it is he just doesn't want to talk about yeah, this. He doesn't, stuff. Yeah. Yes, he, he's done. He got the the book was catharsis. It was a cathartic experience for him. He got he said what he had to say, and my sense is he doesn't really want to talk about it that much anymore. No, he doesn't, I and mean, I don't blame him. And I, I don't. We'd love him. to have him on, but yeah. I don't. I just don't get the sense he wants to. But uh, no, I, I I enjoyed this. Um, again, I, I I'm so proud of that book. Um, it, it, I don't think I'll ever be able to outdo that book. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really um, compelling read, and you really sense the the anxiety and the stress that that life. It is not a romantic. If you think the mafia is romantic, uh, read that book because it, it's it's very anxiety ridden, stressful. Yeah, and he didn't uh, he? I remember asking him, "How did it feel to become the underboss?" It's like I hated it. Right, <laughs> I took right. no joy in it. It was more responsibility, more headaches, more anxiety that was driven by my uncle. Right. Well, another thing in the book we didn't get to, and it's okay, we don't have to, but I just want to mention because it it amuses me ethnically that Scarfo and a lot of those guys, the 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 shot callers in that family at that point were um, Calabrian, Calabres, and uh, so they talk shit about the the Ziggies, the Sicilians. (laughs) I found that funny, amusing in your book, and um, well, I also found it, you know, one of the anecdotes, you know, Phil's the underboss. It's three o'clock in the morning, and his uncle's oh, yeah, calling that's him the best. To, to come over and fix his plumbing. <laughs> and Phil's like, "Call a plumber! It's three thirty in the morning." Right? Said, I don't want to call a plumber. I want you to come over and fix it. Yeah, that's one of the best parts of the book. Is like that—that's—that's yeah. that's, you know, I'm the underboss, the set, right. the number two, and this is this is my responsibility. That's a great. That's a great um, moment in the book. Well, hopefully, um, at some point we can see something scripted from it. I know there's been some ups and downs. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole and give you some more post-traumatic stress, but, but uh, I think one day, I think one day it, it will be developed. There's I know there was some of, momentum. There's and then been it a couple of people and, that have been interested and just ne- you never, 
really uh it kind of died on the vine but uh i, I the the material is too good to, it to deserves never, it to never be adapted it will be adapted at some point yeah well thanks everyone for listening i know this is a little bit longer episode but we appreciate your support follow us on social media subscribe to us i'm jimmy bucciolato and i'm scott bernstein we're out <laughs>